One must qualify himself to enter into such happy plans by sacrifice and service. Those who are sinful in every step of life can expect only to be degraded into animal life, to suffer more and more the pangs of material existence. And this is also stated in Bhagavad Gita 16.19. Maharaj Judas gives good sacrifices and qualifications, were so lofty and virtuous that even the residents of the higher celestial planets were already prepared to receive him as one of them. Here is a scripture which was written down 5,000 years ago and which has an oral tradition uh, far, far into the distant past, beyond 5,000 years. In other words, a very, very old uh, text. And yet, uh, we hear about uh, planets beyond this planet and about persons whose fame is spread not only over this planet, but on other planets as well. Therefore, we have to understand that the great sages uh, of the past, uh, especially in uh, Vedic times, they were aware of information which we in the West believe is very recent. In fact, their uh, information is not something which they um, change according to new information which they gather. Just like recently they have announced that Pluto is not actually a planet. We grew up always believing that Pluto was one of the planets, and now it has been declared that for various reasons Pluto is no longer classified as a planet. Of course, that would not uh, surprise or disturb the Prabhupada, particularly that, uh, that modern scientists change their work, because he said that this is expected. For those who depend upon uh, the research, which is possible through sense perception, they'll always change their words, because the senses are imperfect, and so is the mind. And therefore, knowledge which is gathered with the use of one's senses and one's mind will always have to be changed. And so we see that uh, the characteristic <coughs> of modern society is changed, constantly changed. Uh, nothing is good enough to remain constant for very long. Clothing styles change three or four times every year. It has to be you know, a new fall wardrobe, a new spring wardrobe, summer wardrobe, winter wardrobe. Cars change every year. Uh, food, beds change every year. Everything changes. Uh, and this is the nature of material existence. It's mutable, constantly changing. Uh, on the other hand, we see that those who are fixed in a transcendent philosophy or a philosophy which is connected uh, to a changeless world, they remain very firm and clear, just like uh, firm in their ways, just like our clothes don't change, right? We have been wearing the same wardrobe since the beginning of our movement. It hasn't changed. Uh, our food has not changed. Our hairstyles have not changed. <clears throat> the books we read have not changed. The Sanskrit language, for example, uh, is so scientific uh, that it, 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 it remains uh, exactly as it was thousands of years ago. Some changes may have come in different styles of using Sanskrit, but basically the language itself remains intact. In fact, the entire culture, Vedic culture, has remained intact. Uh, now this may appear to be boring to some persons. They may say, without change, what is life? 
But now, uh, an unknown, you know, life would be very boring. And we see actually that in all the traditions, the model of the world was a known world. The universe was known. The universe was defined. Whereas now, it's not defined. It goes on infinitely. But actually, uh, infinite simply means they have not discovered the end. This would be Prabhupada's response. Infinite simply means you don't know where it ends, so you say infinite. And change means that you're always trying to find out, uh, or if change means that you admit that what you have now or had in the past was not good enough. You're admitting by the fact that you change that what you have is not satisfying. Now, someone may argue, well, the same may be true for what you have. It may not be the best thing, but you're easily satisfied. But that's not very likely. Because we see that the things which we have within this process of Krishna consciousness, whether it's the philosophy, or the food, or the method of worship of the deity, uh, so many things have remained intact and satisfied persons for thousands and thousands of years. Therefore, there must be something uh, which has perfection in everything that we're doing. <clears throat> Unless it was perfect, how would it be able to satisfy very, very different circumstances? Here we are, living in the United States, very, very far away from India. And yet, now someone may say, why haven't you ad adopted uh, a type of Indian ethnicity? This is clearly something from India. So, uh, the form of worship. Uh, but actually, that is not the case. We can say that the Vedic culture was is most recently available in India, that it is only available in India and it ceased to be pra practiced in other parts of the world, but actually it's beyond India. If you go to the planets which are mentioned here, higher planets, they're following the same culture, and they're not Indian. So although people may say this isn't an Indian religion, it's just ignorant to say that. This, it is a fact that this religion remains present in India today. And now, by the grace of Islam, it is spreading all over the world. That, that's true. But it's far beyond India. And the fact that it can be adapted to any situation or circumstance proves that it does not depend upon any national you know, boundary for its, its strength. Krishna consciousness is essential. It is the essence. It is the original consciousness of the soul. And it doesn't depend upon any material circumstance. It can be practiced under any circumstance in any situation. Because it is not a material designation. It is the method of purifying our consciousness back to its original condition. When we say Krishna consciousness, we mean that original consciousness, not the consciousness that we were originally born with in this life. That is not original. That's ignorance. Although people like to think that childhood is a state of innocence, it is not a state of innocence. It is a state of ignorance. It is simply a state of ignorance. A child ignores, you see, reality. They ignore the world around them. So sometimes we think this is an ideal state. Actually, it is not an ideal state. It is a state of, of not being aware. Yeah. Sometimes people say, I, I wish that I could go back to being a child again, that I wouldn't have to be aware of everything in this world. But that is simply avoidance. That's escapism. The world is the way it is. Now, you have two choices. Either you can run away from it or you can change it. If you want to run away from it, this is not a very good food to be. Because people will not allow you to very easily stay here and avoid the world. Prabhupada did not allow it. I remember myself, I didn't allow it. I remember people, when we would go out, just like this evening, we're going to go out on the Harinam party at 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock, we're going to go out and chant 
on the streets to inform and, and affect people's consciousness through the Holy Name. And I recall when we used to go out on the high Nam party, some people would have joined our movement who were escaping from the world. And because they're escaping from the world, the last thing they want to do was to go out back into the world on the high Nam party, right in the midst of all of the you know, illusionary energy. So they would, you know, go and try to hide when the high ground party was going on. And I used to try to find them in all kinds of locations, especially if they would hide by standing on the toilet seats in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> and we would find them out, pick them out on the high ground party. So this is not a very good place for escape. There are many other places you can you know, many other movements that some of you may know about that you can join to escape. You can go into the Himalayas or go into the mountains of such and such place and avoid this world. But our purpose is not that. So Srila Prabhupada, uh, his Guru Maharaj, said that we should establish our temples in the busiest parts, in the busiest places of the world where the most people were, because we are meant for trying to help people. Our purpose is to try and help people. And that help has to take the form or shape of a revolutionary movement. Because people are very stuck in their ways and they're, they prefer uh, to hold on to what they have. Even though the thing which they're holding on to is the cause of the suffering. Cause of our suffering are so many material attachments. I want, I want, I want, I want, I want. We want so many things. And yet the very things that we're holding on to are the cause of suffering. Why? Because the more you hold on to, the more you become attached, the more difficult it is to one day have to leave this material world. And the nature of life is that it leads towards one inevitable event. And that inevitable event is death. You cannot avoid that. And at the moment of death, when you're going to have to leave this body, if you keep feeling, I want this, I want this, I want this, or I didn't get this, and I really want this, and you have to take birth again in another material body in another lifetime, which means so much suffering. So we are trying to put out the fire material want. We're trying to curb our lusty desires. And the process of Krishna consciousness is meant for that purpose. How to reduce a material fever. Prabhupada said when the material fever is very high and it goes up to 108 degrees, that is a sign of death. When your body reaches 108 degrees, it is the time of death. And then it suddenly shuts down. And becomes very cold when the blood ceases to circulate and everything's finished. So we're trying to bring the material fever down. And the way you do that is by building another type of fever. And that fever is called Sankirtan fever. The Sankirtan fever, uh, especially when we say Sankirtan, we, we are talking about glorifying publicly God. That, that's actually what it means. Kirtan means uh, to chant it, loud chanting or broadcast it. In the broad sense, it means to broadcast the glories of God. And that can be done in many ways. Prabhupada said most effectively that we do it through the distribution of these books. I, I am certain that each and every person sitting here either directly came to Krishna consciousness as a result of getting a book, or was helped into taking interest in Krishna consciousness because of the book. Chanting is another form of broadcasting. Prasadam distribution is another way of distributing transcendental foodstuffs. And practically, anything which, just like wearing a dhoti, so many of you go out, and sometimes I see the dhotis going out, and they wear their Western style clothing. I can never understand why do they go out to buy things in their Western style clothing? Because you're a walking advertisement. 
when you go out and you go to your start. Just like people who uh, work for a company, they put the company logo on the car so that they get the extra advantage of the free advertising. This clothing is a free advertisement. Why are you, you know, concealing it? It means that if you don't like the product or you're ashamed of the product. If you want to convince people to buy this product to take interest in Krishna and God, you know, then come out to it. Be who you are. Don't be afraid. So many people become immediately curious or interested when they see us dressed like this. Someone was saying the other day that uh, they were appreciating our, our religion. And they said that in their religion you can't even tell one person from another, but anybody can know exactly who you are, just by your dress. So, this verse today is discussing uh, a great person, Maharaj Yudhisthira, and how famous he was. Now his fame is not the kind of fame that we read about in today's newspapers. Today's newspapers, what's the surest way to make the front pages? Anybody say? Huh? Really yeah, exactly. That's exactly what. If you're a first class criminal, you're sure to make the front pages. <laughs> <laughs> what else? What are some other ways you can make the front pages? <coughs> tragic stuff. Tragic, some tragic act. Sports. A sports. sports. What else? Huh? Gambling. What else? I think most of you don't read the newspaper, does I think I think you get the point. Nowadays, if you do something outrageously, you know, bad, or even just outrageous, which it usually is something not, you know, considered to be very virtuous, it's newsworthy. The fact that, you know, so-and-so Das, or so-and-so Dasi, has been coming to the Hare Krishna temple for 10 years, faithfully every morning, you know, at <coughs> 4.30, dancing in a kirtan, chanting 16 rounds on his or her beats, following four regulative principles. And, you know, if you tell that to a news reporter, it's a big deal. So what, what's, what else is there? Well, uh, so and so does out of frustration from not being able to, you know, convince a lot of people to become devotees, went crazy and started shooting everything. Now that was <laughs> suddenly got to be very newsworthy. But that we did something virtuous and pious, so what? I mean, if you think, consider the, the mentality of today's world. It almost appears that virtue is of no interest, it's boring. People are more interested in, you know, in boring stories of horrible events than they are learning about the saintly character of the person. This tells us something about the population of the world today, that they have become very, very debased. At the time of King Yudhisthira, on the higher planets, his fame was so, so much uh, widespread that not only was he known all over this planet, but he was known on the higher planets. Then one day asked, how was he known all over this planet? What to speak of higher planets? If they didn't have spacecraft, you know, if they hadn't really, you know, where's the question of his fame being all over the world, for example, they didn't have the, the Spanish, you know, the Spanish fleets hadn't gone out yet. Portugal hadn't started going around the world. So the British hadn't gone around the world. How is it possible? The Italians hadn't really gone much around the world. How did this fame get spread all over the world? What's the answer? Can anyone suggest? Word of mouth. How did the word of mouth get there? The word you would someone get down near the water. Say Maharaj, you didn't cross the water. He drummed across the ocean. Huh? He drummed across the ocean. He drummed it. Well, that's nothing. That would be a pretty, I mean, that's primitive. 
But I wouldn't know if they were, you know, maybe some of them have known what the, the drum beat meant. This is pretty, I mean, usually I suspect that most drum beats were pretty simple messages like, you know, here come the enemy. <laughs> How would they know the details about Marge and his good brothers, his wife, and all of this other stuff? How did this news spread? Did anyone suggest? Good job. How did Looney Yeah, exactly. There were space travelers, but they didn't travel by ordinary spacecraft. These persons uh, had the capacity to travel through space without any external material thought. The great saint, Narada Muni, for example, was given a, an instrument known as a bina, and by simply plucking the bina and chanting the names of God, he was empowered by God to travel all over the universe by sound vibration. That makes some sense. I mean, sound vibration can certainly travel in distant places, like they learned how that radio signals are able to be picked up from far distant places. So somehow there's some method of space travel through sound vibration, which Darwin would be new. So in other words, great saintly persons visited this planet at that time. There was interplanetary space travel. And it was they who would go to different parts of the world and who would go to different parts of the universe and explain there was a very pious king on this planet named Yudhisthira, along with his brothers and their wife, Draupadi. And this is what they are doing. But you can be sure that those saintly persons we would never have come here if all they could report on was, uh, you know, Draupadi, you know, has 70,000 people in the Astrodome, you know, rocking to the beat of her singing. <laughs> I don't think that Narada Muni would have been interested in, you know, broadcasting the glories of Jokowi, the rock star. Unless, of course, you know, the uh, lyrics were not Krishna. That might be exciting. The point is not that we have to think of on any type of particular music, but the real issue is, what is the consciousness? No interplanetary space travelers come here any longer because of the level of consciousness of persons on this planet. <coughs> People's consciousness is so degraded now that it's practically a white animal. So why should highly elevated souls come to report about animals? Nothing worth reporting. In that sense, the newspaper today is, you know, it's not worth very much. It's very, very regrettable that they're cutting down trees to make paper to print information about animal life. And this is animal life. Even if it's dressed up in a very sophisticated way, it's simply the barking and mewing. There's like, you know, science is like anthropology. What did Prophet say about anthropology? It is the business of dogs. Because dogs look the very bones. <laughs> <laughs> we actually consider, you know, all of this is education. It's like you have big people with so many high material qualifications. But as soon as they get a little money, and as soon as they want work from some recreation, what do they go to? A topless bar. Their recreation simply see naked, you know, people. And that again, naked people, you know, we get back to animal life. Polished animal society, just a little polished, stiffed up. But the business is the same, the business of animals. Eating, sleeping, sex life, and fighting. And everybody becomes very excited that we can fight such sophisticated ways. We have smart bodies. <coughs> and animals have to use their claws and teeth. <coughs> the business is the same. Fight. So Krishna consciousness is totally a different 
offer. It, it is to um, go from animal life to human life, real human life. What does human life mean? What is it? If, if we ask someone, what is your definition of a human being? And usually people say, a rational animal. <laughs> so there's no such thing as a rational animal. Actually, if you think about it, animals are not reasonable. They're instinctual, but they're not very reasonable. What is it that distinguishes human life from animal life? What's the special quality of the human being? And many of our guests answer this question. Humans have consciousness, and I realize that animals yeah. really don't. But let's, that's a very highly advanced human being. I would say that even a more simple answer is a human being who try to ask some questions which are beyond simply, where's food and where's shelter? A human being can inquire why. Why am I here? I mean, you're already supplying the answer. Human life is meant to realize God. But the first thing has to be that you have to come to the point of question, why am I here? If you don't even ask that question, why am I here? You know what I mean? And how many people, how many humans do you know that ask that question? Or rather, how many humans do you know who don't ask that question? Most human beings never ask this question. Why am I here? They're afraid to ask this question. First of all, they won't find the answer. And despite so much wisdom, so, so many newspapers, so many books, so many elders, how many people can actually give an answer to someone who asks, why am I here? What's the purpose of life? Why am I suffering? I don't want to suffer. Why do I have to suffer? And this is a very basic, simple question. I, I don't want to suffer. I, everything I do in my life is to avoid suffering, and somehow or other, I'm suffering. Why? And is there any solution to this? Why is it that I have to die? I don't want to die. Why is it that even a, a, a small insect has some, some mechanism inside, some type of intelligence, which helps that insect to avoid death, if at all possible? And yet, despite all of our desires not to die, what is inevitable? Death. Why? The human does not come to the point where Entity does not ask this question and not human. This is the human predicament. Why? Why am I here? How did I get here? That means, how did I get here? It means, where did I come from? And what is my goal? What, is, what am I supposed to do with this life? You can see how we have not been given this training from our childhood. Otherwise, every single person practically in the world right now should be on the path of self-realization. In fact, that no one is. If that knowledge is not being given, it's not being offered. If all that's being offered is, you know, don't ask why, just enjoy. Ask how to enjoy. Life is meant for pleasure. If you can, if you can feel temporarily satisfied, that's the success of life. Never mind what comes tomorrow. Or make arrangements that tomorrow you can again smile. There's no higher purpose to life. And this is basic material education that every single young person receives. No wonder people are miss, missing the purpose of life. And no wonder they're spoiling this planet because they don't all there's a huge competition going on to everyone to simply get as much enjoyment as quickly as possible. Because this life is all you have. Now, when did they abuse in this planet? And what happens after death? No one knows. That's what we need. No one knows. So get as much as you can, enjoy as much as you can, and whoever is an expert at that, let him into some high position. He's our leader, or she's our leader. And actually, this is simply animal society. This, this is the mentality of animals. Human life is meant 
to something much higher, as you said. Human life is meant to realize God, to develop God consciousness. Human life is meant to solve. Prabhupada once asked, what is the purpose of this school? Because here is where we had our first guru. Prabhupada asked the teachers, what is the purpose of guru? Does anyone know what Prabhupada is, what the answer was? They didn't give him the answer, but he did the answer. Does anyone know? Yes, what is that? To stop the cycle of government. Yes, that's the answer he gave the teachers. The purpose of this school is to teach the students how to stop the cycle of birth and death, how to stop the process of having to repeat another birth, another death, another birth, another death. In other words, ultimately, how to avoid dying. That's the purpose of education. So that's the fundamental problem of life. The fundamental problem of life is it's going to end. You can say cancer is a problem, AIDS is a problem, you can say war is a problem, but what it all comes down to one point, death. If you can live forever, you know, then there's no question of all of these problems. Ultimately, there will be no question. Because these problems lead to death. My old age is only a problem. Why? Because it leads to death. It's, it's, it's simply a what is disease? Disease is, is, is the process. It's a description of the path leading to death. That's what disease is. What is old age? Again, a description of the path leading to death. In fact, from the moment you're born, what is the path? From the day you're born, it's simply the path leading to death. And you can say, well, this is very pessimistic outlook of life. This is a very depressing, you know, uh, description. This is reality. And this is not actually, you know, what we want. Now, why is it that although this is the reality of this world, we so strongly want something different? Because there's something in us which is not part of that reality. And that something is the soul. The soul is not meant to die. It does not die. It is totally different than this material body. And it is the soul which is crying out, I don't want to die. When a person says, I don't want to die, I don't like disease, I don't like to suffer, that call, that cry is coming from the soul. Because it's the soul which is beyond death. It is the soul which is meant to be eternally happy. It is the soul which is uh, meant to be full of knowledge, not this body. But unfortunately, how many people know about the soul? Actually, no. of course we hear in every religion, the soul, the soul, the soul. But when you look into and investigate religion, what do you find? You know, in one religion says that when the Savior comes, all the bodies will rise out of the graves. And... <laughs> or another religion says, you know, there are no bodies. There will never be bodies again. Just spirits. None of this satisfies us. In real scientific understanding of the soul, you have to go to the Vedic literatures. That is where you get very, very specific information. Where is the soul located in the body? How is the soul connected to the body? This, this question has been a question which has perplexed Western philosophers for hundreds and hundreds, actually thousands of years, the soul-body connection. They can't figure it out. They come up with all kinds of interesting ideas. How does the soul, which is spiritual, connect to the body, which is material? And we know the answer to this from our Vedic literature, but you'll find many very interesting uh, philosophies. Like Descartes, he said it's connected to the pineal gland. He said the pineal gland is the place where the soul and the body are joined. Then other philosophers said they have no connection. Then other philosophers said there is no soul. But here's a simple explanation from Bhagavad Gita that the connection is through consciousness. It is consciousness which connects the soul to the body. Consciousness is the extension of the soul, as sunshine is the extension of the sun. How does the sun touch this earth? What's the connection? Through the sunshine, the light coming from the sun. The sun, light, comes from the sun 
and illuminates this earth, and touches this earth, and energizes this earth, as surely as if the sun directly touched the earth. In the same way, consciousness coming from the soul touches or energizes this body. The soul doesn't touch this body. They never actually touch, but it touches the body through consciousness. And when the soul leaves the body, it takes the consciousness with it, and therefore the body is dead. I think the body is always dead, but it appears to be energized because consciousness is within it. When consciousness leaves the body, it ceases to function. Just like at night, we get some understanding of this when we go as dreams. Your body is inert, practically, it's just laying there, and your consciousness leaves the body, and you travel out of the body in the form of a dream. So when the permanent uh, departure from the body is accomplished, that's called death. When the soul leaves the body and takes with it its consciousness. Persons don't know about this. They don't understand the science of consciousness. That if you want to affect the soul, you have to start by learning how to contact or affect consciousness. How to purify the call. Purified consciousness. Because right now, what happens? Although the soul is pure, our consciousness is not. The soul never becomes contaminated. Never. There's an example given that in the sky at night, the moon is shining. Let's imagine a full moon. Big, beautiful full moon shining in the sky at night. And you're standing by a lake. And in that lake, you see the reflection of the moon. Now, if the lake has ripples in it, right, if you throw a pebble into the lake, and you look at the reflection of the moon, what will happen to that reflection? It starts to shimmer, right? It's not placid and still. Is the moon in the sky is fixed, but the reflection in the lake appears to be like this. In the same way, our soul is like the moon. And because the soul is reflected through consciousness in this body, and whatever affects the body, the body is like the water, it appears the body, the soul, and everyone, I'm moving. But actually I'm not moving, I'm still, I'm fixed. But the consciousness, the reflection, that is moving. So at the present moment, my consciousness is now affected by its contact with matter. When consciousness goes into a material body, whatever happens to the body, I feel it, apparently. Just like my body gets ill, I get affected. Actually, the soul is not affected. The consciousness is affected. And consciousness refers itself to the soul. It informs the soul. And so I feel disturbed. Now what does this mean? What, what is the, what's the overall ramification of this? That if you can purify the consciousness or change the nature of what consciousness is in contact with, then consciousness will become free, happy, pure, unencumbered. So that purifying of the consciousness, that detaching of the consciousness from matter, is accomplished through the chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra. The sound of God's name is the way that consciousness is most easily and quickly purified. Therefore, the repetition of the mantra, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, 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 Hare again, 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 to purify consciousness. What is the result of such purified consciousness? When the consciousness becomes pure of all material contamination, then at the time of death, when the soul will leave the body, the consciousness no longer has anything which attaches it to the material world, and it can go with the soul back to its original home in the kingdom of God. Actually, all of life is a preparation for that one moment. Sometimes we're asked, what's the best time of your life? If you had a choice, 
You can pick any time in your life. Or even before I ask that question, what period, what stage of life does our present day society consider to be most important? Think about this. Right now, in today's world, which stage of life is considered most important? I mean, we have, you know, infancy, childhood, uh, adolescence, uh, youth, well, let's say young adult life, <coughs> middle age, old age. Which stage of life is considered to be most important? Is given the greatest importance? What's your name? Well, those here are different times. Huh? Young adult. Young adult. What age? Say? 20 to 35. Or 20 to 30. Anyone else have an answer? Yeah? Huh? Childhood. Childhood? A lot of attention given to childhood. I mean, I think that you can get the answer to this by looking at advertisements. <clears throat> looking at social institutions, if you see, basically you'll get the answer to this. Is it old age? No, I think old age is certainly not considered to be the most desirable time. In fact, if anything, old age is something people want to forget about. They put it out of the way. Or when you get old, what do we notice with old people these days? They try to act like teenagers again. They even have, I remember what, you know, when I was traveling the buses, we we go through, uh, what's that state? Arizona, I think it was. You know, and you go through these old age homes, old age homes, old age communities. But they, you know, they you see these people in their 70s trying to act as if they're teenagers. Together, or they're jogging together, you know, trying to. So old age is certainly not. Uh, childhood is certainly given a lot of attention, but I would think that at the greatest attention that childhood is given, you know, if you see the heroes, who are today's heroes? That should tell you. They're not child children. Children are not certainly the most <coughs> common heroes. Who are today's heroes? Rock stars, sports stars, probably get the most attention, and they're in their twenties. By and large. So I think that's a problem. Now that is a very major change from traditional society. In, in older cultures, who are considered to be, what, what age was considered to be the most valuable? Yeah, old age. Why was old age considered to be valuable? What we think of today is the most horrible thing. Why was that considered the best time? So you can kick back and do nothing? No, because of wisdom. An older person was supposed to be wise. What's another reason? They were spiritually advanced. Another point is that the passions of the body become reduced as you get older. So you're less disturbed and harassed by bodily passion, which has something to do with wisdom. And what was the prime activity of an older person. Nowadays, what's the prime activity of old people? Mm -hmm. huh? Playing checkers? <laughs> That's a little stereotype. What else? Going fishing? That's another stereotype. What else? Playing with their grandchildren? Telling old war stories. What are that? Telling old stories. You know, telling stories. About their life and so you did. You know what I'm but very few old people are becoming spiritual leaders. <coughs> Actually, that was the business of old age. The old age meant your family your responsibilities are completed. Now you have to take on the family of the whole world. You have to minister to the needs of the whole world. You have to become a spiritual leader. <coughs> so everything was meant to train you for that point. Everything was leading you to that point. Your first 50 years was a preparation towards that stage of when I would have to take on the greatest responsibility of all. And finally, the final moment, the final stage, what is the final stage of life? Death. 
Old age is ultimately a preparation for death. How you pass that test is going to determine your next situation. You know, people don't want to take tests, but believe me, there is a test coming up, whether you like it or not. You may not want to, you know, may not have to go to school to take a test, but you're going to get a test whether you're in school or not. It's called death. And it's going to test how you handle this life. How you have prepared your consciousness for that final moment. You've got to start preparing. On what kind of basis? Just like anything. If you want to become good at anything, what do you have to do? You have to practice daily. And that's what sadhana bhakti means. <coughs> daily practice. Investing, depositing daily, sometime, you know, some effort into your spiritual bank account. Every day, chanting as an example, or reading scripture as an example, on a daily basis. So, these are some general points I have talked about because there are so many uh, of our guests who are here today. But anyway, well, anybody have any questions? Yes? You're saying that, you're saying how all the politics and flies is based on enjoyment. But uh, it seems like we are also enjoying everything. We're chanting, we're dancing, so people can also find it in there. As I said, you guys also enjoying so much wrong with me and them. But our enjoyment is to see Krishna pleased. Our, we are singing and dancing. What are we singing and dancing? Who is, who, whose name are we singing? And who are we dancing for? Krishna. Who are we cooking for? Krishna. Who are we having children for? Krishna. Who are we dedicating all of our life to? Krishna. That's the difference. Yes, we agree. It's just like in the Bible, it so two people were washing clothes. Right? One was taken and one was left behind. What's the difference? The act, act was the same. The activity is the same. But the consciousness, the purpose, the motive, for which each person was acting was different. If whatever you do, you do thinking and dedicating it to God, then it's transcendental spiritual. Whether it's singing, dancing, eating, you know, or doing anything you want to do. Even Krishna says sex like making love. You can have sex, Krishna says, and do it as an act for me to produce a child. Anything can be dovetailed with this. I believe that there's a difference between joy and enjoying. Like one is joyful when you serve Krishna, but the right sense of gratification, one is in the illusion, and one is in the mind. A very nice distinction. The difference between joy and enjoy. Joy is, as Sri Rakhubu says, joy is the pleasure of uh, serving God, whereas enjoy means to. Uh, serve your senses, your own <clears throat> selfish interests. So that's, that's very good. Soup and Ananda. Pleasure, spiritual pleasure. Uh, ananda, which is involved with serving God. And soup, with material happiness, pleasing the senses. Questions? Well, I think my talk was so simple with it. No need to discuss any further. Good job. Very good. Now is the time for what? What's that? What are you going to do? Enjoy the job? <laughs> yeah, not honor for such. Actually, we, we don't say, although it is a great when we eat, we don't say, I'm going to go and enjoy eating. We say, I'm going to honor. The food which Krishna has given. And naturally it's enjoyable. It is enjoyable. It just we don't say don't be happy, don't be pleased. It's not like that. But the re the real fact is that we are pleased because this food has been offered to Krishna. We're pleased that this food that we're taking in the highest form of eating, you're constantly aware of the fact this food has been tasted by Krishna. 
Fourth, that's a very intense stage, especially when you're eating pasta and all other foods. But you are supposed to eat And in reality, that's you read the book of Chaitanya, you see what Chaitanya's book, this food has been tasted by Krishna. So let us go and respect the foodstuffs which have been tasted by Krishna. Shiva Bhagavatam.